Hi there. Today I thought I'll share everything I learned about diet and healing pro prolapse naturally. So I just quickly wanted to share my own story uh, where I come from so you'll understand more. Um, I've been a vegan and vegetarian for um, 12 years, I think, and I was a vegan when I had my symptomatic prolapse. And uh, as soon as I started to work with uh, different women who helped me on my healing journey, and many of them had healed their prolapses naturally, they started to tell me that you should start to eat meat or you know that kind of protein, animal-based protein and collagen. And, um, you know, I was really skeptical, but they told me, you know, you've created two babies and it takes a lot from the body and the body can't, you know, create the type of connective tissue and kind of heal the tissue if you don't support it from the outside. Uh, and I... I've always been interested in health, in what I eat and, you know, been researching a lot on the topic. And for me, it came down to, you know, vegan, clean, um, you know, cooking, of course, uh, your own food, uh, buying only organic um, and so on. So that's, you know, been my base for such a long time. But it's... It finally, I felt, you know, I feel so bad. I, you know, I'm depressed. I don't feel I want to live almost when my prolapse was symptomatic. So after like six months, I, I thought I'll try it, you know, what might happen. Uh, but I was really identified with what I was eating because, you know, I thought it was the cleanest. And so many studies talk so good about, you know, plant-based food. But now I realize that it might be studies done on men because uh, it's a huge difference on women and men because of, you know, of course, our cycles, our hormones, but also especially if we've given birth. So, yeah, I started to include different things, which I'll share here. And I ch changed my, my diet and um, I, I feel it has had a good effect on me. You know, it wasn't like I took my first bite of a, a chicken um, and I felt my prolapse went up. That's not the case. It's, it never is with natural healing. You know, you just, you keep on doing different things and it all adds up. And since I don't have any symptoms today, I feel I've, I've done something right or I've done a few things right. So I'll, I'll show you, uh, I'll begin with this study. Um, sorry. Uh, that I found on, um, collagen. And as you can see here, uh, so for prolapse in young women uh, and that's you know if they're young um they have their their tissue is even more responsive or like vital than in all compared to older women M many actually feel their prolapse getting worse around menopause so uh, th and that might be also because of their diet and you know um, the body not being able to to build the strength that it needs or the the tissue um, and especially I talk about you know scar tissue and hypopressives and stuff in other videos and I my thinking is that you know if you support the body with the right things um, nutritious things all of the exercises and things you do to try to heal your pro prolapse will, um, you know, the, the body will respond even more quickly, I think. Uh, so uh, this is an article just showing that um, there was less collagen in young women having prolapse compared to women not having prolapse. 
And I think this, I mean, it says quite much. Um, and then I wanted to listen together with you on uh, just a short bit of this podcast. Um, Kimberly Ann Johnson is amazing. She, I love her book, The Fourth Trimester. You, If you're postpartum now or if you're pregnant or planning on being that, you, I really, really recommend it. Uh, and, and she has been trained in the scar tissue remediation by Ellen Heed, who is also in this conversation. And they talk about different things to heal pelvic floor issues. And that one component is, um, you know, diet or what we eat. And it's, it's crucial actually for healing. And they have been working with women hands on, hands in to heal prolapses and also giving advice on different, um, lifestyle changes and so on. So, um, yeah, it's super interesting. Me with either pain after childbirth or sexual pain and how I'm usually helping them is by connecting the trauma and the emotion with either the scar tissue or something biomechanical. And then often we'll touch on biochemical because, um, you know, if anyone ever comes to me with a prolapse, I'm always going to be interested in what their diet's like. And if they've, um, if they're not, they've been naturally flexible because that's going to tell me that their ligaments aren't going to spring back into form as readily as if somebody has the more collagenous connective tissue type in general. Uh, uh -huh. Um, that stronger connective tissue might be a preventative pro for prolapse. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm saying that I think that people with weaker connective tissue are in general more likely to prolapse or if they do prolapse, the recovery is slower because there's more to build up, especially if they've been a vegetarian or vegan. And I find that these factors compound each other because they, you know, well, myself, I was drawn to yoga um, before I started yoga. When I was 13, the week I got my period, I went to summer camp and all my summer camp instructors were grateful deadheads and vegetarians. And I thought they were the cool, they were the first like really nice older people. And I thought they were all cool. So to be cool like them, I decided to be a vegetarian too. And then this happened to coincide with the week I got my period. So then for 20 years, you know, seven years later, I found yoga most people who are going to do a yoga practice are, are naturally flexible. We go towards what we are good at. I, I, by the way, like I'm not, I wasn't like trying to be on the sprint team because I hate running. I think probably most people with very elastinous connective tissue aren't like natural runners in general. Uh -huh. Um, so the people that are already drawn to yoga tend to be flexible and then tend to compound that with the vegetarianism or veganism. That's an ideological choice, but also that's going to even create more sensitivity. And those factors end up leading sometimes to those birth outcomes of, of difficulty in repair tissue repair. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk about how that works. Yeah. Our body, we were talking, we've been talking about collagen, that collagen yeah. is the basic protein building block of our tissue. Connective tissue is what we're made of. If you took out all the muscle cells, all the bones, all the nerves, and all the blood vessels in the body, you'd still see a 3D human form in connective tissue. That's how much connective tissue we have. So whether our connective tissue is relatively more collagenous and strong and protein building block based, or whether our connective tissue is more elastic, more flexible, and gooier, essentially gooier. One is essentially springy and resilient, like a super ball. The other one is essentially gooey and flexible, like chewing gum. Some people are like super balls, and some people are like chewing gums. They even call they call us what Gumby girls, right? Because I'm one of those Gumby girls. Gumby girls tend to go toward flexibility. They bias towards fle preferring flexibility based gymnastics, ballet, yoga, and maybe Pilates are ways that Gumby girls will tend to go to because of destabilization. Those are all things that can build stability. However, if you're a Gumby person and you don't get enough protein, 
your already weak connective tissue gets weaker. So in order to get the kind of protein that is collagen, you can't, plants don't make collagen. Animals make collagen. And sometimes, especially if you're a new mom, you just used a ton of your collagen making a baby. And you used a ton of your minerals making a baby. It didn't come from anywhere but your body, the ingredients to make that child. If you don't replace those ingredients, the essential minerals, the essential collagen, the essential amino acids that only happen in certain animal-based fats and animal-based proteins, your connective tissue is going to take a lot longer to repair. Yes, exactly. Um, so I just find this information really inspiring. And if you haven't been a vegan or vegetarian, maybe, you know, if you are postpartum and you are experiencing a prolapse, why not adding some more collagen? And then the question comes to what type of collagen? And I've been explore, exploring uh, this uh, myself a bit. I found it really easy to start with the collagen powder because I could add it in my smoothie uh, like every morning. And I didn't really notice that it was an, an animal product for me. That was my process. But as I started to read more, I realized, you know, clean food is also a very important component uh, when in any healing state. You don't want to have things in your body that creates um, friction for healing to happen or even, you know, maybe worsening the symptoms. So here I found this. Um, comparison of actually bone broth and collagen so um collagen like powder that you can buy if if you want to use that it's really important that you find a good brand good quality organic brand um always with anything that you put in your body but especially with this because it might be that they put shit inside um, and, you know, if you, if you take that as a supplement, you don't want to be working against your body with it. And the other option I had, I got from a teacher was bone broth. And the first time she mentioned it, I was just like, so you want me to, to take the bones of an animal and cook it for 12 hours? I just couldn't see myself uh, be doing that. So um, uh, it took some time. I used the powder for quite some time. But then I realized, you know, if I anyway buy chicken, I can buy the chicken and I can boil the bones. It also feels better to really use all the parts of the animal com compared to, you know, just buying small things and then maybe they throw the rest. Still very important to find then animals, if you're eating animal products, even if you eat meat or uh, you, you make this bone broth or maybe what I've been more into lately, because uh, I'm also learning about, you know, the cycle, the menstrual cycle and the hormones. And I realized that um, uh, I want to add some uh, internal organs in my diet. So I'm now eating liver and uh, kidney and heart and um, some crazy things. Uh, I, I feel I don't have anything to lose trying all of these different things. I, I'm just seeing it as an experience um, and like a part of my healing journey. So this, uh, here you can see uh, the, the components of the, the two. And, you know, that collagen powder is lacking compared to the bone broth. Uh, and I mean, this is nat naturally, uh, natural. Uh, so our ancestors, they ate this like the um, way, way back 10,000 years ago when people were, I don't know, living in caves or something. They, they found an animal, they ate the organs, they took the bones, they boiled it for a long time and so on. So it's more going back to that. And I think more and more 
resources and research are showing that that's kind of the food we are meant to be eating. Um, we, our bodies can't really handle like processed things or too much of um, grains um, or, uh, I mean, there's so many things and I don't want to make it like huge here. I'm just going to tell what's optimal. And if you're watching this and if you feel you are intrigued and you want to try something, choose one thing or two or three, if it feels possible for you. Uh, you know, you don't have to do it all the way, but I'm going to tell you what to do all the way. So you can kind of create this aim in your head, what you're going towards. And maybe you take away some things, you add some things and you feel an effect or not. And then you can include it again if you didn't feel any effect, for example. So here I found this really interesting uh, blog and she has written about, uh, she has healed a uh, few things herself. Um, everything from hypothyroidism to um, yeah, other diseases. And uh, she had written this post about um, pelvic floor dysfunction and, you know, how does our diet uh, affect uh, our uh, pelvic floor? So you can see here, she has summarized, here is um, pelvic organ prolapse. So it's on her list. And uh, so if we scroll down here, if my internet is not too slow, you will see that she talks about, so this also depends on what type of symptom do you have. And many people with pelvic floor dysfunction, uh, they, they experience some kind of pain. So even they have like a hypertonic pelvic floor or um, they, I'm sorry, I'm just scrolling here. I'm trying to find what I uh, wanted to say with this. Um, yeah, so uh, many people have pain. And the point here is that she's saying that, uh, and many others, uh, is that, you know, an anti-inflammatory foods um, are the best foods to support pelvic floor health. And the reason for that is that if you have any kind of inflammation in the body, maybe you don't have pain uh, and that's great. The thing though, is that if you have any kind of small inflammation that you might not be noticing, that might be uh, uh, you know, an, an obstacle for your healing to happen. So even if it's, and, and it might even be that, you know, you have scar tissue in, in after childbirth, for example, and scar tissue, in scar tissue, since the tissue is not organized in a healthy way, it's more dense than, you know, no circulation can happen, nothing can come in there, but it needs oxygen and it wants to connect to the nervous system again and all of that, but it can't if you don't start to work with it, with all the different things we have. Uh, and it might be that inflammation can sit here too, and that might cause pain. So there is uh, something called the autoimmune protocol, um, which, you know, is actually used now in the healthcare system too, some in some countries uh, where they recommend, you know, um, it, it's, it's like a protocol and you follow it for X, uh, number of weeks and, uh, you just eat super duper clean. I don't know if you've heard about paleo, it's quite close, but I, I'd say autoimmune, uh, protocol is even more, you know, you take away so much things, but eating clean, what do I mean by that? Um, it's nothing processed. So definitely, you know, no sugar, no, uh, flour. So you can't, you know, bake anything or you can't eat any grains and uh, not even, you know, rice or oats or anything like that. So, you know, if you think of paleo diet, that's kind of how 
our ancestors ate from the beginning. That's, you know, they didn't find like this rice field and uh, <laughs> finding all the rice and cooked a big rice um, uh, casserole every day. Uh, they ate more meat, you know, berries and vegetables and everything was clean. So uh, I liked what um, one of my, my teachers said that if you're in the store and if you're, you're looking for something and if it has more than two ingredients, it's not food. And I mean, that's super strange because in a supermarket, if you go there, it's going to be like one fourth maybe of everything that's in that supermarket that, that you can look upon as food. So I've been experimenting with this. Uh, I try to keep like on a paleo diet, which is again, very close to the autoimmune protocol. But in the autoimmune protocol, you also take away some, you know, the nuts and um, you eat less uh, kind of uh, uh, fruits and so on. So um, yeah, I mean, this is really depending on where you are. Um, also there are, you know, especially like if you have a bladder prolapse or, uh, rectal prolapse, it might be, if you look into Chinese medicine, for example, they say you don't want to disturb the bladder, uh, by eating, uh, chilies or drinking coffee, or, you know, you can almost imagine things that will create any disturbance for the bladder. Uh, also if you have incontinence, of course, or UTIs or stuff like that. But this is just, you know, I'm a, not an expert and it might be that if you want to go into this, either you do what I said, uh, so you can just, you know, take one thing, maybe you stop drinking coffee or maybe you just add that collagen or whatever. Um, if you want to do this, maybe you should find someone who can help you. Um, so you find someone locally or online, uh, I'll just post all the links here, um, in this, from this video and you can, you know, start to do your own research, but this is what I have found. And as I told you, I have only improved. I can't see that I've taken steps back backwards from doing all of this. So I really think that this part has helped me. Actually, that's like on the side, but I have less PMS symptoms since I had my period again after giving birth the second time. My period was super heavy and I had so much pain, like, you know, um, contraction pain. Um, and it's gone like within a few months and I bleed a lot less. And that's also another thing they say, you know, if you tend to bleed a lot during your period, it might be that you have an iron deficiency, which is so ironic, but that then again, like meat might help. So enough about this. I hope that you uh, gain some new knowledge and um, let me know how it goes for you. Like if you can share in the comments, um, what have you tried? Is there something of this that you have tried that worked or didn't work? Or, you know, what would you recommend to someone who are struggling with this? Let's share and open up and uh, help each other. Thank you.